The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Michelle Vieira, Manager of Plant and Animal Sciences at PacBio, and I want to welcome everyone to the PacBio webinar series with today's topic focused on the low DNA input workflow for genome assembly. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speakers who will present in the following order. We've got first up Aaron Bernberg, Senior Scientist at the University of Delaware Sequencing and Genotyping Center, followed by Scott Hotaling, Postdoctoral Researcher at Washington State University. We have a lot of really great material to cover, um, and the presentation portion of the webinar will be followed by a Q&A session. Um, I encourage you to submit your questions at any point during the webinar by typing them in the area provided in your attendee dashboard. Um, and then I will uh, ask the questions to our speakers at the end for live um, answering. Um, we'll also be recording this webinar and making it available for download in the next few days. So please keep an eye out for a follow-up email with a link to this recording. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. So I just want to start with a little bit of background on how this workflow came to be and what's coming in the future. So as you might know, PacBio has been chosen as the core technology for several large-scale genome initiatives like the Vertebrate Genomes Project and the Darwin Tree of Life Project. However, we were noticing that the required three micrograms of DNA for a library prep was kind of difficult to come by in a lot of the small-bodied species that make up a significant portion of the tree of life. Um, but of course, there are ways to try and overcome the DNA input requirements, one of which being a pooling strategy where you use multiple individuals to get enough DNA. Um, unfortunately, that significantly complicates the bioinformatics as it adds in multiple haplotypes that the assembler has to tease apart. So in the end, your resulting assembly is uh, kind of a mishmash of pseudo-haplotypes and no longer represents the organism of interest. So it's not the ideal um, way to overcome this. Um, another way is that many labs would opt to inbreed to help reduce the heterozygosity from pooling. Um, but of course, that takes a lot of time and effort to inbreed for multiple generations. And again, leaves you with an assembly that now no longer represents the true diversity in the genome of interest. Um, so kind of with all of that in mind, we wanted to tackle the problem from the other end by reducing the DNA requirement as a whole. Fortunately for us, Mara Lonacek and Matt Berryman at the Singer Institute also have this as a goal. Um, so we teamed up for a collaboration to work on assemblies from single mosquitoes, um, which give roughly 200 nanograms of DNA from a single uh, individual adult, which gave us kind of a range to hit uh, for a target on input DNA. Um, what came about from this collaboration was the low DNA input protocol, which utilizes the Smart Bell Express template prep kit for a quick a uh, four-hour library construction only takes half a day. Um, it's been applied to several different species at this point, including mosquitoes, Drosophila, parasitic worms, um, and now the ice worm that's going to be shared with you here today. And while we're super happy that we can now address organisms that have DNA content in the hundreds of nanograms range, um, we're not resting on our laurels either. I am pleased to share that we are now developing an ultra-low DNA input workflow that is amplification-based and would require only single-digit nanogram amounts of DNA. Um, this, of course, could be useful for the smallest of organisms, um, as well as potentially needle biopsies or single-colony bacteria. Um, so be on the lookout for that over the coming months. And so now to to uh, tell you about the details of the workflow, I'll turn it over to Aaron Bernberg. Uh, hello, everybody. Sorry, I'm just getting my screen in presentation mode there. Um, can everyone see that? Yes. Okay. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, give a small pitch uh, to the user group meeting since you guys are coming to see us here um, at the University of Delaware. Um, and if you don't know where Delaware might be, um, we're smack right here in the middle of um, the uh, East Coast Mid-Atlantic region. You guys are going to come sort of right to where my pointer is right there. Um, and we hope to see you in a couple of weeks. You'll see our campus. We'll spend some time um, at a historic DuPont estate um, for some fun time in the evening. 
Um, so I hope you all can see it. If you're registered, great, and we'll see you. If not, you can go to um, PACB.com and, and sign up. Um, so next slide. My PowerPoint is freaking out. So uh, problem of the day is uh, low input, and I want to introduce you to guys to the glacial ice worm, um, which Scott's going to tell you much more eloquently about, but um, came to me uh, in a 50cc tube in the mail. Um, these guys are the coolest thing I've ever seen. They like to hang out um, in ice cubes. So um, they, they pose a challenge for DNA isolation. Um, how do we get them out of the ice cube to, to isolate them? So I just wanted to show you a little video here that I took. Um, we, we can convince them to wiggle out of their ice cubes. Um, and so once they cooperatively wiggled out, um, I was able to get them into a tube. Uh, they are small. They are very fragile and very delicate. Um, so they pose some DNA isolation issues. Um, and their genome is giant. They have about a one and a half gigabase genome. So uh, this posed a challenge that we thought the low input um, would be great for. So DNA isolation, uh, we used Kyogen's Magatract high molecular weight DNA kit. Um, at the time, this was the kit we were most familiar with. Um, it gives you pretty good flexibility in elution volumes and things like that. It's a bead-based kit. Um, so we went with that for this particular uh, creature. Uh, once we had the worm in the tube with some lysis buffer, we just used one of these um, polypropylene micropestles, um, inserted in the tube up and down a couple of times, depending on the worm, broke them up pretty well. As I said, they're pretty fragile, so it wasn't a big challenge. Uh, we carried out the lysis at 56 for 30 minutes. That's way shorter um, than what the kit recommends. Um, it may have been even a little long for these guys, uh, but you don't need much time to break them apart. Um, just as a note, uh, we did modify the protocol a little bit, took away the thermomixer steps. They recommend using a thermomixer. We've replaced it with um, room temperature rotations. We see a bit um, better size profile coming out of the kit that way. Um, and I do recommend if you use it to do two elutions. Some of the larger fragments don't seem to come off the beads very easily, um, but they do uh, come off eventually with a second elution. Um, so what did we do here? We had two worms and two isolations that I'm going to tell you about today. Uh, Scott sent me lots more worms and we had lots of other isolations, but these are the two we're going to use for the story today, uh, lovingly referred to as worm one and worm three. Um, later, you can see profile-wise they look pretty similar. Uh, the first one we got about 750 nanograms from. The second one we got about 500 nanograms. Uh, Size-wise, they look relatively similar. Uh, the worms do vary a bit in size, um, so the yield was not a big concern why one was a little shorter or uh, a little on DNA. Um, at the time, we were going to go ahead and use the Express Template, uh, Express Template Prep Kit V2, uh, which was beta tested at the moment. Um, I realize it's now live for everybody, and, and we've switched over to it for using um, for almost all of our workflows for SQL, um, but at the time, uh, it was new to us. Uh, and since we had two different isolations, we took sort of two different approaches for making the library. So let's talk about that worm one first. We had enough DNA there that we thought perhaps we could um, do a size selection before starting the library prep. So we went ahead and did that. These worms are super pigmented, as you can see in the um, video. And so uh, we've had pigment problems with other things before. And sometimes when you run the DNA through the blue pippin, uh, comes out the other end, not just size selected, but a little bit cleaner too. So we thought that was a, a decent approach. Um, for anybody who's familiar with using the blue pippin, one never quite knows what we get off the end of it. Um, so we recovered about 100 nanograms of size selected DNA, um, which was enough to make a library from using this protocol. Um, and it's a it's low concentration, but we, we have a library there and it's sort of a decent size. Uh, with the other worm, worm number three, we just went straight ahead with the 500 nanograms that we had, no size selection before doing the library prep. Um, but after the library was done, we uh, cleaned it using a modified Ampere protocol that I'll tell you about uh, in a minute. We, no surprise, got lots more library, plenty of library to use um, with a similar size profile. Uh, this is that 
um, protocol for using the Ampere beads. Um, really all you do is do a two and a half um, X dilution of the stock Ampere beads, and then you clean the library with 2.2 X beads. Uh, it helps you get rid of um, anything that's 3 KB or smaller. So this is what the two libraries um, ended up looking like. So we have a, a worm number one and worm number three here, sort of side by side. Um, you can see, let me just show you what they look like in comparison to their starting um, GDNA. And you can see that the size selections do work, right? We are losing a little bit of our, our smaller fragments here. Um, and relatively, they look um, similar. Uh, we had no problem. These traces are from our Agilent Femtopulse, um, which we use an awful lot to help us um, at every QC step. So we knew what we were looking at here. Um, so I'm going to tell you how we approached it putting on the instrument. So we were talking back and forth with PacBio. Um, our library from Worm 3 was prepared first. Um, so we went ahead and put that in on the instrument on a standard 1M cell, um, back, went back and forth about movie time. We decided on a 10-hour movie with a two-hour pre-extension. Um, if you guys are familiar with loading stuff on PacBio, you know that the initial on-plate concentration is a bit of a moving target. Um, and it's a bit of a stab in the dark sometimes. Typically in our lab, with this size library, we're shooting for anywhere between three and six picomolar. We chose four on that day uh, and we pretty much nailed it. We ended up with about 60% loading, which is good. Uh, the library performed well. We got 14 gigabases of data out of it. Uh, polymerase read length around 22 KB, which is nice. Uh, and the insert N50 was a little over 10. Um, just for a note, for those of you that run PacBio instruments, typically when we uh, use a binding calculator to um, anneal and bind the library, um, due to volumes being what they are, sometimes you end up binding uh, way more library than you actually need or can possibly run in the seven days that that binding is good for. Um, so one approach we've taken is to anneal a full library prep, but then only bind half of that annealing. Um, and you can store that annealing at minus three for future use. So anybody else that's that's perhaps new to SQL or, or not tried that before, um, you'll see why it becomes important later in the talk. But I just wanted to mention that was an approach we took here. Um, one note, when we when we saw this insert N50, um, we thought that that was a little short. Um, and this particular setup is not how we have been running libraries on our instrument. Um, at the times, we, we've noticed that we get a little bit better um, length out of running on an LR with a longer movie with no pre-extension. So we just gave that a try. This is exactly the same binding that I showed you before. This is just the next day. Um, we tried with an LR smart cell, a 15 hour movie, no pre-extension, same loading concentration. You can see the loading is very, very similar here. The yield is very similar, um, but we do get a 4 KB increase in polymerase read length. Um, and a 3 KB increase in insert N50. Um, so from now on, if we're gonna sequence more of this worm, we're gonna go with that. Um, but I just wanna get back to worm one, that blue Pippin selected DNA. Um, how did that look? We, would, we were hoping that would uh, perform a little bit better, maybe perhaps give us a bit longer read length. Um, so we went again with an LR smart cell, 15 hour movie, same loading concentration. Um, and what we see is a similar polymerase read length here. So perhaps uh, our fear of the pigmentation was not a big deal, um, or the DNA coming off the end of the blue pippin was no cleaner than what um, the stuff we put on was because it didn't perform a whole lot different. You do see the insert N50 get quite longer, almost a 9 KB in increase in insert N50, which you will, is not necessarily surprising because we did do a 10 KB cut um, on the blue pippin. However, the yield was uh, pretty disappointing for this. And, and we're not 100% sure why that's the case. Um, for the low input, we are using a different binding calculator than what is on uh, SmartLink. So you use a specific low input binding calculator. Perhaps this could be adjusted um, to get better loading. However, the amount of library that we have for this particular project is um, not gonna be enough. So it's, it's too low. So we scrapped this library. Um, and went back to our Worm 3 library. Um, and our initial discussions um, with the group were to run a total of six smart cells. So these are just the um, second four, the last four that were 
or run the numbers that you see here are for the total for all six cells you can see we're right where we um, wanted to be from the first cell 22 kb relength um, and our um, insert n50 is a little over 12. so that was sent off and then um, i had radio silence for for a little bit while they worked on that data and then uh, a little bit later it came back and asked if perhaps we could run a bit more and because we had saved that annealing um a couple months later pulled it back out of the freezer and ran an additional four smart cells um, you can see it performs similar in loading to everything else um, as far as read length it performed pretty well um, just like the one that we had seen before um, so what we end up with at the end of um, 10 cells is about 160 gigabases worth of data um, at almost 22 kb polymerase read length and again the insert and 50 is almost identical to the um, previous stuff that I showed you. Uh, so at this point, uh, that was what we sent off um, to be done. And, and Scott's going to talk to you in a minute about what he did with that. Um, but I just wanted to wrap up a few points from, from my end, uh, just that uh, if you've ever had the opportunity to, to have a big project and you can't fit it all on your instrument in the seven days and whatever, you can sort of save yourself some time by storing the annealing. Um, and then you pull that back out sev several months later and it performs uh, in a similar man manner, even though it's a separate binding. It, the library seems pretty predictable as, as far as what you're going to get. Um, with that blue pip and size selected DNA, uh, what it did show us was that you can certainly make a library from as little as 100 nanograms. That was not a problem. Um, yields a library that sequences fine on the instrument. We could talk about whether we can tweak the loading or not. Um, but depending on the size of your genome and the desire, desired coverage, uh, maybe that's not enough. Uh, in this case, that was not enough for us. Um, so we went with that Ampere size selected library, which performs uh, just as well. Um, we sequenced 10 cells, generated about 160 gigabases of data. If you do a raw filtering um, in SmartLink, uh, it seems like about 60 gigabases of that data is 10 KB or larger. Um, we did not sequence the entire library prep. So what I told you was 10 cells, but we actually had enough to do um, maybe 16 or 17 cells, depending on loading concentration that you're gonna use. So um, the low input works. You don't need as much DNA as, as everyone is worried about needing for PacBio. Uh, you can generate good data with it. Um, and I just wanted to uh, give a couple of shout outs. Uh, thanks to Scott and Joanna for allowing us to be part of the project. Uh, this little critter is the coolest thing I've isolated DNA from um, in a long time. So it was a, a challenging project and it was quite good. Um, thanks to Nick and Heather and Michelle for their contributions um, with technical questions. Uh, and I just want to give a shout out to our team here at UDSGC, uh, Bruce, Mark and Salma. Thanks so much. Uh, we are a small but mighty team and I can't thank Olga enough. Um, she is my partner in crime and all things pack bio so she deserves as much credit as I do for what uh, you guys just saw uh, if we can help you with a project that would be great you can reach out to us on our website or we're also um, a pack bio certified service provider you can find us on their website as well and with that I will uh, throw to Scott great um, so I'm really excited to get to pick up where Aaron left off and tell you about the actual ice worm genome work. So ice worms, as anyone that knows me knows that um, I will take any opportunity I can to tell someone about ice worms. I think they're incredibly fascinating creatures. They live in places that I love like Mount Rainier and they can, I think we can learn a lot about um, genome evolution and extremophile biology from this pretty large bodied, I use that with air quotes, um, organism that lives in glaciers. So. To give you a sense of where ice worms are from, this is Mount Rainier, one of the places I work on them the most. If you can see my cursor, this is the Tahoma Glacier. And ice worms tend to hang out around this area, this kind of lower part of the permanent ice. And I'll talk more about why that might be. Um, and so and I'll just make a quick note that if you're excited about this project and don't want to wait until I finally publish a paper from it, I do post semi-regular updates that will hopefully increase in frequency on Twitter. Um, at my handle at Mountain Science, and so feel free to follow along there. So I want to first introduce people to mountain glacier habitats that uh, haven't 
thought about these as much as I have. The point of this photograph or this um, uh, schematic is to show you that there's actually a lot going on. So people think of these of glaciers as being essentially um, nutrient poor, bio, biodiversity poor, just not much living there. And so there are things like big snow algal blooms that occur on glaciers which actually can reduce local reflectiveness and cause um, increased melting. But this is generally a microbially dominated landscape. And so it's mostly bacteria, fungi, and algae. But in some cases, there are these larger organisms. And if you are going to live on a glacier, you essentially have two major physical challenges to deal with. You're in a world of snow and ice. So there's constant cold and free stress. And then as if anyone who's ever gone skiing on a bluebird day, um, with the reflectiveness of snow and being high up, these are some of the most um, UV intense places um, in the world. So when we're thinking about ice storm evolution, these are the two um, physical stressors that I'm largely uh, thinking about. And so just to give you a sense of this, I mean, one of the things people usually also think about when I talk about ice worms is that these must be really rare creatures that takes me a really long time to go actually find. Um, and so if you actually go to one of these glaciers, like the Noisy Glacier in North Cascades National Park, every single one of these little black lines is an ice worm. So these things can be at densities of hundreds per square meter. So we're talking tens of million um, worms in a single glacier. And so they look like this. Their species name is Mesenchytraea solificus. And solificus, um, interestingly, literally means fleeing from the sun. And so as you can see, they're very darkly pigmented. Uh, Aaron raised the really good point that that pigmentation, I mean, that is likely a, a morphological adaptation to their environment, but also it creates this big challenge for, um, for preparing, uh, extracting DNA from them. And I've had a lot of challenges with that when it comes to preparing population genetic libraries. And that was one of my uh, biggest concerns about these was like, great, we have this low input DNA kit and we have this little organism, but can we actually even do it with this uh, added layer of a pigmentation problem? So, spoiler alert, we can. And so to give you a little sense of this, there's a great Nat Geo video from a couple of years ago of ice worms actually in their environment. So I'll point out a couple of things here. One, these are annelids. So they're just segmented worms. You can think of them as a distant cousin of an earthworm. And then they are literally, as Aaron also showed, within moving around in contact with ice all the time. So they're, they're very much at this, um, uh, melting freezing point of water essentially perpetually and so they live in coastal glaciers from central Oregon all the way to Alaska and there actually is another species of ice worm um, from Tibet which is an entirely different lineage that we don't know much about but one of the long-term ideas of this project is to not only sequence the North American ice worm genome but also the Tibetan ice worm genome to understand how you know two different uh, we think independent origins of this uh, glacier uh, survival. And so, and they also, they're essentially can be aquatic to whatever degree they want. I mean, we've left them in water for weeks and they're totally fine with that. And so, but when they are in water, they kind of form these bundles that has been, been generally considered like a mating behavior. But I actually think it's more that they want to hold on to something in case there's any kind of meltwater flow so they don't get um, washed away downstream and off the glacier. So, a little, a little basic um, ice storm ecology to uh, give you, a, give the ecologists in the um, in the audience a, a little bit of a, an interesting story here. So when I see millions of ice worms on a glacier in a place that is generally nutrient poor and doesn't have a lot of biomass, it's a pretty kind of shocking thing to think about from an ecolog ecological standpoint. And so, to understand a bit about ice worm genetics, we did a, a population genomic study uh, last year. And for those that care, we use double digest rad sequencing. Um, for everyone else, don't worry too much about that. So we sequenced worms. We collected worms from nine different sites from Washington to Southern Alaska. And just to give you some kind of complex figures that I'll tell you the, the short story of, the really striking thing that came out of this, I mean, the, the first thing was that um, worms from different glaciers are largely genetically distinct from each other, which we would expect based on uh, general population genetic theory. But this one worm from um, Vancouver Island, this little purple part right here, was really closely related 
to worms from southern Alaska. And so this has actually been seen a couple of other times in different data sets. And so it's actually, we're pretty sure it wasn't an error. So once we were sure it wasn't an error, it was like, well, how do we explain this? And so we think it's birds. And we actually now, as of this year, have photographic evidence that birds like the gray crowned rosy finch, the highest elevation nesting bird in North America, actually actively feed on ice worms during their reproductive breeding period. And again, you can see these are all these little black lines are individual worms. So they're very abundant and they're really easy to pick out when they're super dark against a light background. So why did we do this? Um, I think it's not only a test of the low input DNA protocol. I mean, that was a, a pretty good motivation in its own right from a practical standpoint. But ice worms are, are pretty fascinating biologically. They're the largest organism that spends its entire life in ice. It's unclear how they have adopted such an extreme lifestyle. Like, how do you live in such a cold, um, UV-rich environment? Understanding extremophiles kind of tells us a bit about the in members, is how I think about it, um, with of the evolutionary process. So we can understand a lot about where evolution can take a lineage when there's a really strong, sustained, unusual selective pressure. Um, and then these are ice worms. Like they are literally worms that live in ice. So I mean, pardon the bad pun, but I think that's a pretty cool um, thing to think about. So our basic layout for this was to first sequence and annotate the ice worm genome and compare it to other species I'll talk about in a second to understand the genetic architecture of what is actually in the ice worm genome. I mean, one of the kind of fascinating things that the low input protocol is going to uncover in these larger tree of life genome sequencing projects is like, we really don't have a good sense of the genomic natural history of the tree of life. And so lineages like the ice worms are pretty far from anything else that's been sequenced. So, I mean, just looking at what's in there is um, in its own right, a pretty interesting uh, pursuit. And so, but we wanted to do more than just sequence the genome. So we wanted to layer some valuable phenotyping on top of it. And so that's gonna be, that's twofold. So what temperatures can they tolerate at the low and high end? And then how do they deal with UV? Like what actually is their UV tolerance? I mean, we can assume some things from their pigmentation, but um, actually quantifying it's a different story. And then for both of those, we're gonna, we're actively collecting RNA sequencing data um, to put not only the context of the genome evolution, but also potential gene expression differences um, in relation to those phenotypes uh, in context. And just as a, a bit of a spoiler as well, we've spent most of the summer on the phenotyping because the summer is when you can study ice worms. They spend nine months or so under seasonal snow. And so we can't collect ice worms after about maybe the end of September. And so it's a pretty short w window to learn a lot of things. And so we're kind of still, we're just now really digging into the genome itself, which I'll, I'll show you where we're at so far. Um, so it is pretty exciting though, because people have been sequencing genomes for a little while now, and it's getting increasingly empowered by uh, technologies like the PacBio long read data, as that gets more and more through, higher throughput. Um, there are other species that we can use as comparisons to actually understand what has happened on the ice worm branch of the tree of life versus closely related species. And so there's an earthworm genome from a couple years ago. There's a marine polychaete um, from a nature paper in 2013. And then from the same paper, there's also a leech genome, and then there's a limpet. And so we have an annelid, the ice worm, then we have three more annelids from different families, and then we have an outgroup um, uh, Limpet, and then we can also, I mean, go and uh, we'll pull some other genomes to, to flesh this out a little more. So our basic questions, this is actually from um, some looking around for ice worms a, a while back on the south side of Mount Rainier, this photo at sunrise is a really pretty um, place to be, although it's a little chilly at times. So just from a purely physiological standpoint, how does an extreme lifestyle translate, does, does an extreme lifestyle translate to extreme by the physiology? The answer is probably yes. I mean, it's kind of obvious, but I think the, the more interesting thing is how, what exactly are the, um, how is an ice worm an extremophile and what capacity um, can it do interesting things? And then what genes and pathways have been under selection in ice worm genomes? Um, and then how do those relate to that, uh, the morphology and physiology, so things like pigmentation? And then something I think a lot about, um, I think there's a good system for it is to look at 
potential congruence between genes are under selection as well as differential expression. So not only can you change the protein, can you make more or less of it um, in response to a, a physical stressor or some kind of um, in, inducing thing in your environment? So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the physiology of what we've learned this summer. And this is all going to be really, really new data, like in the last like few weeks. So no one take it too, too seriously. This is mostly just exciting stuff to share. This is like talking about this over a beer is how I view it. It's not, I'm not publishing this or saying it's definitive yet. Um, so there is a little bit, and I mean a little bit of previous work done on ice worm thermal tolerance. So it's all in this one paper and it's in these eight lines from 1985. And the key part is that ice worms immersed in zero degree water throughout their lives can super cool down to set minus seven degrees but are freezing intolerant, and that they are auto-lysed on continuing exposure to temperatures above five degrees Celsius. So what this is basically saying is ice worms are a very, or a stenotherm. They can only handle temperatures within a few degrees of freezing. And so, unfortunately, there's no methods in this um, paper. It does refer to Rainier. So we went out to Mount Rainier and collected worms again, and, um, and in collaboration with Katie Marshall at the University of British Columbia, we actually decided to, you know, Let's retest this in a way that we can, you know, know exactly how it worked and we can write it down and see how that relates to uh, John Edwards' um, observations from 30 years ago. And so our first thing, all these sample sizes are approximately um, 10 individuals. They'll all be, I'll show you percent death on the um, y-axis and then different temperatures on the x-axis. For temperature, all the exposures are a single hour and they, the worms were ramped, they're in water, and they were ramped at a quarter of a degree per minute up and down, or down then up. And so it's a very slow ramp. So there was no shock um, induced here. And so just remember that we would expect there to be basically survival only in this like zero, minus five to five degree range. And so at the low end, we see essentially exactly that. Once you get down to negative five and below, we see 100% death, no recovery, and really pretty dramatic injuries. So there's actually like the body cavity has, um, uh, you know, like in like obvious lacerations and things are spilling out. But what was really shocking to us was when we started trying to figure out the high end of their temperature, um, the thermal tolerance. And it turns out ice worms can not only handle five degrees, they can handle 10 degrees, 15, 20, 25, and we only start seeing any actual um, lack of recovery upon a one hour exposure at 26 degrees, which is essentially room temperature. This is all Celsius. Um, and to show you that, there's a little video of what worms look like after um, a one hour exposure followed by two days of recovery at two degrees Celsius. So these two are worms in uh, 25 degrees, perfectly happy. 26, you can see a little bit of auto lysing and you can actually see a little bit of movement in this worm right there. So there's a little bit of survival. And then 27.5, just nothing. So a little pile of, of ice worm goo. So we're pretty sure that that's the upper limit there. Um, but another component of this is, can they freeze? And I mean, it's, it's, it's a pretty, it almost feels like a dumb question because they live in ice and around ice. So there's nucleating agents perpetually in their environment that could freeze their tissue. And so we developed this little assay, um, which where we put ice worms on the surface of an aluminum block. Um, and just to back up a second, the previous ones for temperature were frozen in blocks of ice. And so there we know the temperature of the incubator and we know the temperature of the water and the frozen, um, the frozen uh, stuff, but we can't know for sure that the ice worm actually froze itself. So it wasn't a test of can they freeze or not. It was a test of can they withstand this temperature, which is a little different. And so here we put them in little pools of water, just tiny little droplets of water on the surface of an aluminum block. And then we cooled the block extremely slowly until we observed freezing on the surface, so like negative one or negative two degrees. Um, and then we could take a paintbrush and actually check if the worm itself, if its actual tissue um, was hard or not. And so it's a much better way to test can they freeze. Um, and so the results were pretty, pretty wild. So first of all, they can't survive an hour of being frozen. They can't even survive five minutes. 
they can sort of survive a minute of freezing, so a tiny little bit. And then if we just do a control where we don't actually freeze them, but leave them in those little droplets of water for an hour, they're 100% happy they could persist for as long as you wanted. So turns out they can't really freeze, which means they are living at the absolute lower limit of their thermal tolerance, which is pretty fascinating in its own right. Um, and so, but where the story like really gets pretty wild for me is when it comes to UV. So all of this work is done in collaboration with Aaron Overholt and Craig Williamson at Miami University in Ohio. And this is like 72 hours ago kind of um, level of results. So really like no one take this too seriously. We are very excited about it. And we think we're really onto something, but um, I'll mostly just show you because it's it fits in with some of the larger um, story. So we did UV tolerance assays where we exposed um, individuals to a dose of UV, it's in kilojoules per meter squared, a standard um, metric, and tried to find the LE50, so the lethal exposure at 50% of the population. So essentially, what level of UV for a set amount of time um, kills half the population? So for tardigrades, the kind of classic tolerant to everything, send tardigrades to space, um, about 61.2 will kill half the population for this species, um, which I won't even try to pronounce. So 61. For all invertebrates Aaron and Craig have ever tested, um, which is mostly aquatic invertebrates, the highest number is for um, about 116 for Hesperodiatoma Shoshone, which is a little copepod from high elevation lakes. We move into vertebrates for the same for Aaron and Craig also. The highest value they've ever seen is for embryos, of Rana Cascada, um, a really a high elevation frog from the Western US. And so remember, 61, 116. Ice worms, 424. And so we're talking, you know, seven times tardigrades, four times this um, high elevation cup of pod, higher than this vertebrate in embryos. And this is exciting because that value might even be a little low because still, we weren't quite seeing 50% death at that level. So it could be even higher than that. So it's a pretty incredible um, uh, example of, of the extreme physiology of ice worms that we're looking forward to exploring from the genome level. So actually sequencing the genomes, we talked a bit about this um, with Aaron earlier, but I'll just add some, some historical context. There have been previous efforts to sequence the ice worm genome. And there have been two major problems. One, it's inconveniently large. And so a bunch of short read data isn't gonna do a whole lot when you have a 1.5 gigabase genome in terms of um, contiguity. And then there was some degree of pooling of specimens to get enough data, enough DNA for um, library preps. And of course, like uh, Michelle said, that introduces a lot of individual specific noise, which clouds and clutters the actual assembly. Um, so we collected worms from the Paradise Glacier on Mount Rainier and sent them live to Delaware to Aaron and Bruce. We extracted DNA from a single worm, which is incredibly exciting. We used the low input DNA kit, and then we did 10 smart cells and assembled it with the, a Falcon assembler, which is um, developed by PacBio. And so we got a bunch of data back, one worm, one library, 10 smart cells. We could have done more if we had more money and wanted to. But we got a bunch of a bunch of data back and we think it's enough for what we want to do. And so to give you a little insight into the actual ice worm genome, the genome size compared to those other species I talked about is inconvenient. Um, it's unfortunately large. It's similarly large to the earthworm genome, its closest rel relative that has a sequence genome. And compared to those other annelids and that um, mollusk, it's, you know, we're talking three to five times larger but it's contiguous. So it turns out when you use a lot of high coverage, long read data, um, you can put together some pretty impressive genomes. I know this isn't like impressive in the scale of packed biogenomes. And it actually, um, this level of contiguity makes us wonder if there's actually something about uh, earthworm and iceworm genomes themselves, like some kind of repeat structure that makes them hard to assemble. But I mean, we're talking a thousand times or something more more contiguous than the earthworm genome and larger chunks than the other um the mollusks and the annelids so just for anyone who doesn't know what this is this is a contig in 50 so it means that 50 percent of the assembly are in contigs 
184,000 base pairs or longer. So that's pretty incredible um, in the in the broader scope of, of genome assembly. Um, we're getting a little spoiled now as pack bioassemblies um, become increasingly common. We think those numbers could be higher, but it's pretty pretty good. And so then this is um, a metric of how complete the genome is. So using uh, single copy boost codes. So it's a reference panel of genes that are supposed to be in single copy across a large group of animals. This is for all metazoans, it's about a thousand, I think. And as you can see, about 88% of those are present in the iceworm genome, which is comparable to the other higher quality uh, annelid and uh, mollusk genomes. And then the earthworms, not quite in that category. So we feel pretty good about this. And so we haven't, we haven't dug in much more than this, but we did a little quick analysis just to show you uh, the potential power of this that we're excited to, to leverage in the coming weeks um, that essentially asks this, answers this question. So cool, it's more contiguous. Like, do we actually care practically that we have um, longer sequences, um, bigger chunks? And it turns out we do. Um, I think that's a pretty obvious thing to most genome biologists and most everyone would agree with that. But just to show you, there's this gene AMP deaminase, which is a key regulator of energy metabolism in, eukary in eukaryotes. And it's been looked at um, in ice worms as a potential place where uh, to learn about ice worm adaptation to a cold environment because ice worms do this cool thing where they actually ramp up their energy levels as they get colder, which is essentially the inverse of what a lot of organisms do. And so there's actually a partial sequence of AMP deaminase available for ice worms. So we pulled that, looked for it in the pack bioassembly, and we found that it's on our 385th contig, which is 372,000 base pairs long. And we also looked for it in the earthworm genome, and it's on a contig that's only about 12,000 base pairs long. It's all there with tons of information around it in the iceworm genome, but in the earthworm genome, um, of those 540 amino acids, about half of them were missing on both ends of the protein. So that obviously would make it a lot harder to do any kind of comparisons if we're gonna try to pull it out from there. And so, but looking at it kind of more broadly, in a previous um, alignment to a bunch of other AMP deaminase genes, I know it's a little hard to see, uh, before the ice form alignment stopped um, right here and was missing all of this, this information um, on the end terminus of the protein. And so if we look at it now with the new alignment, we have much more, you know, 40% more um, alignment, which if you think about this across 20,000 genes in the genome or something, there's so much more power to look from gene to gene at uh, variation that might be uh, um, evolutionarily relevant. And then also thinking about beyond within gene variation, we can also think about things like copy numbers. So um, we could find, we can look at something that's like of interest that might be at multiple copies and look at structure of how a copy, uh, a copy number expansion occurred and don't have to look at individual um, uh, copies or try to guess how many there are um, in the genome from other, other metrics. So with that, I'll talk about some next steps. So we're, we're kind of full speed ahead digging into the genome now to get it annotated and to make some uh, preliminary comparisons about genome evolution. But I wanna raise one challenge. So if we're gonna start talking about doing low input for organisms where we're just gonna put you know, an ice worm in a tube or even a tardigrade in a tube, extract all the DNA and sequence it, contamination is not going to be a risk. It's an absolute certainty. And so we sequence an entire ice worm, all of its gut contents, all of its parasites, whatever was on its body. And so we certainly have contamination in here. And so the, I think a big challenge for um, not just pack bio, but just anyone working in this space is how do we develop tools to really deal with this on a, on a, in a high powered um, efficient way. And so we're gonna test out, we're gonna use this blob toolkit, which was published a couple of years ago. and has been recommended to us to taxonomically uh, annotate um, the iceworm genome context and try to pull out ones that are obviously bacteria or obviously algae or something else um, before we move too much further. And so, and then we're also looking at some morphological uh, analyses to better understand this UV tolerance. So this is actually a cross section of an ice worm and all these black uh, circles are melanocytes. So they produce a lot of melanin and we'd like to understand not only physically what that looks like, but then possibly, you know, 
evolution and pigmentation pathways that might be underlying this extreme uh, phenotype or potentially expression um, differences. So with that, I'll just acknowledge that I work with a bunch of really amazing people um, from a bunch of universities, national parks, PacBio. The kind of five leaders of this project are Joanna Kelly, Craig Williamson, Aaron Overholt, Katie Marshall, and then Peter Wimberger. And so they're my kind of partners in crime for this. We've gotten a bunch of funding from all sorts of places. And again, if you want to talk about this more, I have a website, I have an email address, and you can find me on Twitter at Mountain Science. So I will kick it back to um, Denal for uh, wrapping up, and maybe, maybe it's Michelle for questions. Great. Thank you, Scott. That was excellent. And thank you, Aaron. Um, yes, we are now going to shift into our question and answer session. Thank you to everybody who's been submitting questions uh, throughout. So I'll go ahead and just um, start asking them, and we'll get some answers flowing. So the first one is for you, Scott. Um, how many chromosomes does the worm have? So I actually don't know the answer to that. That's a really good question. I should I should I should dig more into um, analid uh, karyotyping. Yeah, that's one that's I haven't I haven't thought too much about. It's my first foray into analid genomics. So. Okay, great. And um, another question for you, Scott. Do you think the pigmentation is due to the high UV that these uh, worms experience? Um, absolutely. So I think that's a. I think the high UV is certainly part of that. It's clearly not. They clearly not worried about blending into their environment. So any um, pressure from the birds eating them, there's no uh, substantial driver there of their of their uh, phenotype. So it must be. I mean, it has to be something with the UV in, in these habitats. I mean, their their sto their their UV phenotype is so extreme that I think it's actually probably multi layered. It's pigmentation. It's biochemical. Um, and then there's some behavioral stuff where they actually only come to the surface late in the day, which I think is to avoid the really, really high midday um, UV exposure. Okay, great. And then one that I think maybe, Scott, you and I can tag team a little bit, um, a question about whether or not there are special assemblers needed for low DNA input data. Um, and what analysis tools we recommend. So starting with the first question, um, no, you treat it like any other long read data set you have. So if you have a particular assembler that you like to use, um, it is more than likely um, able to be used with this data, keeping in mind whatever coverage levels you need. Um, of course, internally, we use PacBio tools like Falcon and Falcon Unzip, um, but maybe Scott can talk about some of the other tools that he also used with this data set. Yeah, so I mean, I think it's, just to echo Michelle, there's there's no there's nothing special about this. Once once I got the data, I actually have a similar high coverage um pack bio long read data set from a polar fish. And once I have the data, it's 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 normal um it's normal uh process from there. Although I do think there's a level of um greater concern about contamination when we use whole organisms instead of just using tissue from a muscle or something. Um but yeah, I've also tried um, using Canoe, which we're still working on. It's 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 taking a, a pretty long time to run on this data set. So we're trying to figure out if there's something going on with the actual uh, version I'm using or something along those lines. But we're going to compare them. But the Falcon assembler did a great job. And so I'm not too concerned about the that we need to get it that much better, essentially. But we're trying to do our due diligence to get the best we can out of it. Great. Thank you. Um, and now we've got a, a couple questions more on the workflow side of things and uh, potential optimization. So I'll take a couple of those. Um, the first one being, does low input work on the SQL2 system? Um, and similarly, can you do hi-fi sequencing with the low input um, to maybe improve the genome? Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, the, the low DNA input workflow can absolutely go onto the SQL2 system, assuming you're using um, the appropriate amount of DNA to be able to load onto the smart cell ADAM. Um, and in a similar vein, um, it, we haven't fully worked it through, but in, in initial studies, it is looking like HiFi does indeed work great with the low input protocol, um, and we will be working to develop that further. Um, okay, another question for you, Scott, um, yeah. or on the scientific side of things. Um, do you have plans to do any population resequencing using the new reference genome to follow up some candidate genes that may be targets of selection? Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, that's certainly once we find things that are interesting. I mean, the ISOM has a big range, and there's actually 
I mean, from our paper that we published last or this year in Proc B, it looks like there may be a species level split between ice worms in Alaska and ice worms in um, the lower 48 in Canada. And so it'd be really fascinating to go back actually into some of these different populations that look across latitude, you know, how does a gene of interest or genes of interest vary? So absolutely, that's kind of, I mean, that's the, that's the, that's the kind of stuff that this, that having the core um, resource of the genome empowers uh, for future work. Absolutely. Um, and then Aaron, uh, I've got one for you. We have a question about whether or not we've tried a, a large insert library for this. Um, I think that kind of goes back to the initial size selection one that, that we tried. Um, and maybe you just want to reiterate that. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously we tried for the largest insert library that we could um, possibly get. There was no shearing done on the DNA. So this is just what we got out of every worm and went forward with, with library prep. Um, I'm not sure why, uh, obviously the inserts were much larger for that blue pippin selected DNA. Um, we're not real sure why the loading was so low on that. And it could just be a calculator tweak. I know the calculator for the low input stuff has been updated since we, since we used it. And maybe you could um, eke enough out. Uh, the problem is we just didn't get enough yield of that. We started with you know only 100 nanograms, so we didn't get a whole lot of library out. So it doesn't leave you with a whole lot of room. Um, you could certainly probably do some other DNA isolation kits and, and perhaps get longer DNA resulting in a longer insert library. Something like the circulomics nanobind kit. We have some experience using that now in the lab and, and we get really long DNA there. Um, I don't know if it worked for this amount of input or what the recovery would be from that. Um, so yeah, it would just it would just all depend on how long you can get the DNA. Um, I, I would consider our library at th of, you know, an average size of 30 KB to be a decently large insert library, but you're right, there there are a lot um, a lot of opportunities these days for things longer than that, so. Yeah, and I would also add on that um, for, for many small bodied organisms, that 100 nanograms, the, the library that, that came from the size selected um, DNA might be enough, right? This genome is over a gigabase, so we needed uh, specifically more DNA than that. Because, but the good thing is this low DNA input protocol is scalable, right? So you can start as low as 100 nanograms, and we've actually demonstrated you can go down as low as 26 nanograms for something like a Drosophila genome, which is, you know, under a couple hundred megabases. Um, so that's the other thing to keep in mind when when planning your experiment is is um, whether having size selection is more important and the genome isn't so large that you can push um, push the yields lower or um, whether or not you need absolutely every little bit out and so size selection um, no longer becomes efficient or viable. So lots of things to keep in mind. Um, and to that end, we actually have um, a whole application note describing all of those little caveats and when to um, push in different areas for this protocol that you can find on our website as well. Okay, um, let's see. Another question we have is, could you do ISOSeq for genome annotation and low DNA input on the same sample? Um, if you have enough sample, absolutely, right? So if you think about um, uh, the example I showed of the mosquito, um, that mosquito project was actually done with half of a mosquito. So theoretically, the other half of the mosquito could be used for RNA extraction um, and then go on to, to do ISO-seq sequencing and analysis. So it, it just depends on um, how much DNA and RNA you can get from a single organism and how you split that up. But definitely worth thinking about up front to see if you can um, uh, get the best of both worlds there. Um, Another question I got is, can you share links to the protocol and the user guide? Absolutely. Um, when we email, you can go to our website and search for it now, but um, I will also include the links in the follow-up email when we send you the recording of this webinar, so look out for that. Um, okay, another question we got here. Is Blob Toolkit the only software for filtering for contaminant DNA? Are there other good options? Um, so I know there's a couple of options out there. This is not my area of expertise. Scott, I know you've been looking into it. I don't know if you have any additional suggestions or Aaron. Um, I think it's something that we're all just kind of newly exploring. Yeah, I mean, I don't have anything that I'll 
pitch out right here, having not dug into many of these, there are a number of ideas and they're all based around essentially blasting contigs and looking at what they might hit or developing reference libraries that you can compare your genome against of known um, sequences. But I mean, one of the kind of inherent challenges to all of this is that, I mean, there are a number of papers showing that there are contaminate, contaminants in a number of reference genomes. So it's kind of a bit circular and I think it's gonna be a lot like um, taxonomic discrepancies as the molecular wave hit with sorting out species boundaries. Like as we sequence more things, we're gonna have greater opportunity to actually pull out what's what and, and, and piece it all together. So at this point, we just have to do the best we can and think about it carefully um, with any of these assemblies. Absolutely. All righty. Well, it looks like the questions have kind of tapered off a bit. Um, so I think we can go ahead um, and uh, close things up for the day. I'd like to thank Aaron and Scott for their time today and the terrific presentations they shared. Um, in closing, I wanted to briefly mention kind of three things. Um, first, we have recorded this webinar and we'll have it available for download in the next several days. So keep an eye out for a follow-up email with a link to the recording as well as to the protocol um, and the, the application notes. Um, also via email, please keep an eye out for an excellent offer. Um, maybe it's a discount uh, from the University of Delaware Sequencing and Genotyping Center. So again, um, keep an eye out for that via email. Second, you can stay up to date on all of our upcoming webinars as well as conferences and trade shows where you can meet with us um, by visiting and bookmarking paxd.com slash events. Um, and finally, if you have an interesting research project that could benefit from smart sequencing, definitely consider applying for one of our many smart grant programs uh, to win free sequencing. Uh, for more information on that one, you'll go to paxd.com slash smart grant. Um, so with that, thanks again for joining us today and I hope you'll join us again on a future webinar. With that, take care and have a wonderful day.